obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Medical Cell Biology and Physiology. In 2009, she got her Bachelor's of Medicine and Surgery, and she is currently in the data collection phase of her Master's in Medicine. All of this through our own bits. She worked as a medical officer in surgery at Charlotte Montague, and is currently <laughs> holding a registrar post in general surgery at Chris Honey Baragwana Hospital. She has had numerous publications, and she is a proud mother <laughs> of the Nelson Mandela's Children's Trust Registrar's Post. Please welcome our speaker for tonight, Dr. Taryn Gaber. to continue with the thanking of thank yous. Um, having me here is amazing. Uh, I think your team as a surgical society, you guys, you're insane. Like, this is amazing. I mean, I'm, I went to lectures at med school, so this is amazing. It's like my time is food. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so thank you for that. Um, thanks for having us here in this unbelievable facility. and. As uh, Rudolf said, even though I'm one of the bursary holders, this is actually the first time I've been to this hospital. So this has been a really great experience for me, and half the reason that I brought my posse. <laughs> also, in case you don't laugh, so yeah. Um, but it's really been great, so thanks, thanks for having me. I mean, this is an unbelievable facility um, that I can only imagine is going to be a massive advance in treating the children that make my coming to work worthwhile. So, without further ado, um, you guys, the society, sorry, I'm not just for mine. How irritating is this? <laughs> okay. Um, so the Vit Surgical Society asked me to talk about pediatric surgery in South Africa. <laughs> I don't know where do you even start with that, right? Okay. Also, how do you speak for 40 minutes? Have you ever been asked to do that before? <laughs> anyway, you, you calm yourself down a bit. You have your obligatory glass of wine. <laughs> it will become a standard. Um, and then you realize that you are nerdishly passionate about what you do. So actually, your problem tonight is going to be to get me to stop talking, and I apologize. But bear with me, because I'm going to take you on a journey of my experience of pediatric surgery in South Africa, and I really hope you enjoy it. So there's a couple of things I've been asked to talk about today. Um, the first is more the clinical side of things, which is the fun stuff, the reason that you've gone into medicine, so you can see patients and do things, and that's awesome. <laughs> Um, and then also some of the socio-econo, you know, political stuff. I thought I was quite clever when I made that word up. Turns out Google proved me wrong. It's a real thing. Um, but, you know, stuff about, like, you know, what is the baseline stuff? What are the, what are the fundamentals? Can I actually work in this field, in this country? What, you know, what does it mean for me? So we'll cover a few of those things as well. But let's start with what is pediatric surgery? And... Um, Pediatric surgery is surgery in the realm of the little, right? And sometimes they're not so little. And in fact, some of the manly men kids that we have that are <laughs> dads. So it's one of the things that really is amazing about pediatric surgery. And one of the things that I love about it is that our scope of practice in this country is enormous. There's really, there's really not a lot that we don't do. And pediatric surgery is actually one of the last true vestiges of general surgery in this country. And my clicker, how, how far this way do you want me? There we go. Okay. Um, so it's one of the last true vestiges of um, general surgery. And it's not like that everywhere. We are blessed to work in a country that allows us to open our doors to everyone and to operate on everyone. And I think one of the things that you have to keep in mind then is um, at some point you have to learn to say no, right? Like, maybe I can't do this. It's a very weird feeling for a surgeon. You know, we can do it for him. Anyway, but Theodor Kocher, he's, I don't know if you've been in surgery before, there are instruments called the Kocher instrument. He said it very well. Um, and he said, a surgeon knows how to operate, a good surgeon knows when to operate, and a great surgeon knows when not to operate. 
And I think that that's something that we always have to remember going through, and especially if that's you know where your passion lies in surgery. It's not enough to know that you can. It's to know when you can. Um, and with that, I thought, how do I even, you know, where do I start to show you guys what pediatric surgery is about in this country? Um, how can I show you how wide our scope is? I mean, I only have 40 minutes, right? So I thought, let me quickly go through some of what we do that overseas and in other places is covered by other specialties. Right, because that will give you a broadish view of what we as general pediatric surgeons do here in this country. Oops. ENT. Oh no, I'm doing plastics, ENT, we do everything. Um, all right, so the picture at the top is a little baby who was born with a congenital epilis. Oh, sorry, I must also thank my colleagues and also my big fan there in the front. Um, these are all pictures from our practice. So these are not downloaded with the internet. This is not something that you might see that is rare that you won't see anywhere else. These are from our own practice. Um, if they're not pictures directly from us, I've referenced them. Um, also, there are pictures of winkies and vaginas. Okay, so I'm just warning you, please don't be offended. Right. So this picture is a congenital epilis. Um, it's a gingival tumor that children get. It's quite rare, but we treat them here, not the MTs. Um, if you go into the realm of surgery, whether it's pediatric or otherwise, you will come across children who eat things. They all eat things. They all eat everything. And a lot of the time, they get stuck in their throat or in their trachea or midway down the esophagus. We take those out. And that's really awesome because they come in, they say they can't swallow, they're truding, and then have 15 minutes in theatre, and all of a sudden, they come out happy, and everyone's you know, going home. It's a really great feeling. Except my kids are always poor. Other people take out five grand. I only get 20 cents. <laughs> um, the other part of ENT that we also do, which is possibly more ENT-ish, um, so things like tracheostomies, and we do airway protection for babies as well. We've got a great um, team at Barrow who also makes tracky teddies so that you don't feel alone. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, plastics, uh, as you know, in general, overseas, plastics is... Um, <laughs> takes care of the burns patients. Uh, not so here, as you'll know, even from the adult surgery, we do all of the burns, okay. So everything from very large areas, superficial burns, like on the top left, to those which are, you know, more unfortunate, full thickness burns, like this little boy who burns his whole wind, poor thing. Uh, I feel like there's a trick. There we go. Okay, um, oncology is really a massive, spectrum of what we do, too much to go into on a single slide, but um, this was one of the cases that really stuck with me, and this was an older girl, as you can see, she's one of the not so little littles. Um, she came in with this debilitating massive tumor um, of the left chest wall, and although this was a palliative procedure, so it wasn't going to cure her, she wasn't going to live, she had metastatic disease, we managed to spend six hours in the theater painstakingly peeling this tumor off of vessels and muscles and that kind of thing. And um, I think you'll agree that the cosmetic um, result here is unbelievable. And apart from that, this 16-year-old girl got to get up and live the last couple of months of her life as a normal person, right? Imagine for a moment, and these are the things that you'll have to think about, I'm not just being rude, but imagine for a moment that you just wanted to have sex once. Okay, before you die in a couple of months. But you can't because look at your breast. And you can give that to somebody. That's an amazing gift to give. Cardiothoracics. Um, we do a lot of cardiothoracic work, but the cardiothoracic surgeons are also very, very busy. So most of the time they're quite happy that we do our little section of cardiothoracics. Um, again, here looking at the contrast of the patients that we get. So on the left hand side, this is a chest x-ray of a young girl who had presented with just a small lump on her chest wall. And uh, then we did the x-ray, and I think you'll agree that that um, cardiac shadow is somewhat worrisome. Turns out it was all tumor, and it was invading into the chest cavity, it was invading into the pericardium. We had to take it to theater, remove some ribs, take it off of the heart itself, and then put it back together. The next picture is the complete opposite end of the scale. So you guys have all heard, I'm sure, about esophageal atresias and tracheoesophageal fistulas. 
forgive me if I get into too much terminology, you guys will get there, you know, your six lectures of pediatric surgery, like you're really ready for it. <laughs> um, but uh, well, this is a simple procedure, simple. We, we take this part of the esophagus off of the trachea, sorry guys, um, and we reattach it to the top part, the atretic part of the esophagus. Now that's all fine and well, and it sounds like, you know, a great, that's a great surgery, but I want to take you to the pictures of the actual procedure. These tiny little nubbins that you see over there are the two ends of the esophagus. Okay, for those of you who have been in theatre with us before, um, will know that the theatre sheets that we use, these um, badges or stamps, hospital stamps that are on the sheet, are about the size of a five rand coin. So that incision is less than a five rand coin. Okay, it's less than four centimetres. You have to operate through that. It's so small, in fact, that most of the male surgeons with bigger hands can't even fit their fingers into tie knots. So you try and like tie them to their keys and stuff. Okay. Unbelievable surgery. So you go from that, where you're removing half a chest wall, to operating within four centimetres. Okay, urology. Um, in this country, we have a severe shortage. Oh, gee, there's gynecology, urology. This is amazing. Luckily, it's not one of those question presentations, right? What is the answer? Uh, there we go. Okay. So, urology. Um, in this country, there are not a lot of pediatric urologists. In fact, I think we have two. Um, and one of the reasons that we're so excited about this hospital is, I don't know if it was covered on everybody's twist, but the drive to try and make pediatric surgery more specialized. Um, you know, when you go to the States, they don't have, you don't do pediatric surgery and then do pediatric urology. You do urology and then you do pediatric urology. Completely different spectrum to what we do here. And it's one of the reasons why our scope is so wide. It's one of the reasons why I love working here but it also means that perhaps our patients aren't getting the best care, because certainly it would be better done by somebody who does this every day. So that picture on the left-hand side is a little boy, not a girl, that's a boy. Uh, he has got a bifid scrotum, he's got testicles in each side of that scrotum, and he's got a very, very severe hypersphalias. So the opening for the urethra is almost on the perineum, and the whole penis is squished over like this, bent. This is just the first pe uh, part of the procedure, so he'll need more operations. This is by far, like, not the last one by far. But you can see the difference in just straightening that cordy, what that does, and the length that you can attain, and that this little boy will one day be able to stand in a men's room and pee. Big deal for him. Mm. At you, at me. Ah! <laughs> okay, so gynecology, um, the initial picture, which we'll try to get to there. Um, this is just basic gynecology. This was an ovarian mass in a 12 year old girl, just presented as a pelvic mass. Um, it was luckily for her not a tumor, like we thought from the initial CT scan, but was in fact just a, an ovarian cyst that had hemorrhaged. So that one we managed to take out, and she had a really good outcome. But I would really be remiss in mentioning gynecology in pediatric surgery without talking about where my absolute passion lies, which unfortunately is the bum. I know, I like, why? Why would you choose that? I don't know. Anyway, but part of that is colorectal and pelvic reconstruction. Um, and this is a little girl who was born without a vagina, vaginal atresia. It's not a common presentation, but we do see them. And in this procedure over here, we do a laparotomy take a piece of her small bowel, and we make her a vagina, so that one day, she too can have sex, like a normal person. It's amazing. I'm scared now. I don't know. She doesn't maybe do it for me. So I keep pressing one, two, and then it goes like 15. Just push Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, we also dabble in neurosurgery, uh, not a lot, and certainly the neurosurgeons are taking over and doing far more of these. Um, I think a lot of the history of pediatric surgery in general in our country is just that we were 
forced to take these cases because there wasn't anybody else doing them. So my limiting the skills, we do still do, especially if they're small babies, we do still put in VP shunts every now and then. But you know, hopefully that will be taken over more and more by the specialists. Um, hepatobiliary. It actually doesn't project too badly. So that baby on the left hand side, you'll see his eyes are the same color as my stethoscope. Um, and that's because he's got biliary atresia. And that's a condition where the gallbladder and the bile ducts just don't form, right? So they become progressively more and more and more and more and more jaundiced. Um, and for that, we do this awesome procedure called a Kasai portenterostomy. And Kasai was a great man. Um, figured this out purely by accident. Big mistake. Uh, was operating with a colleague of his around the port of hepatitis, dissected a little bit too close to the liver. All of a sudden, there was much of bleeding. And he was like, well, I can't put in a drain. Oh, dear, what am I going to do? I can't buzz the liver because I'm going to kill all the bowel ducts. I know. But you just get a small piece of bowel, and I'm going to attach it to the liver, and that will drain the blood. Excellent, excellent. And three days later, wasn't he surprised to find that all of a sudden, his baby had green poo? Amazing. And out of that one mistake from bleeding, so came the Kasai portenterostomy, which has saved a third of patients with biliary atresia from liver transplant. It's a huge thing. And the little boy on the right hand side, that's Nasir, he's a very close to my heart baby. Um, that in the bowl at the bottom there is the right side of his liver that we took out. Um, he had a massive hepatoblastoma. The picture on top is him two months post-surgery. Um, his family had a really cool little t-shirt made that said, I beat cancer, what's your superpower? <laughs> okay, next one. GIT, as you can imagine, GIT is something that you would expect a general surgeon to get into. Um, and again, the scope and the difference in size of the patients that we work with. So on the left-hand side is something called a malrotation. Okay, um, that bit in embryology where the bowel herniates and turns and you don't remember really what it's about, but it sounded pretty cool, so it sticks in your brain. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't do that properly. And what it is, it's almost like putting the whole of the small bowel on a washing line by one peg. So what it means is that everything can twist around, and the entire small bowel twists around its mesentery, and these kids can lose their entire small bowel. Now, maybe in the USA and in Europe, you can be put on home TPA, and then you can have a small bowel transplant and you can spend four months in hospital, but that's not what happens here. So when your small bowel dies, you die. You'll see in this picture, this child was very lucky. We managed to get into theater just in time. You can see the color of the colon at the top, which is pink and beautiful. And you can see the color of the small bowel, which is uh, particularly purple. Um, but that bowel picked up and that child went home in three days time. Uh, on the right hand side is a patient with Mr. Hirschsprung's disease. Now his entire small bowel is this little schmelz in the middle. And the rest of that is colon. That entire thing is colon. So this kid, his Hirschsprungs had been missed for so long that he presented with this massive colon that ended up going for an exploratory laparotomy for bowel obstruction. Cool. Colorectal, as I said, one of my favorite. Um, the picture on the left is a cloaca. So if you think of the perineum of a female child, uh, think of it in terms of bowling balls. A bowling ball with three holes, that's normal. Okay. Anus, vagina, and urethra. Bowling ball with two holes, very difficult. So a urogenital sinus and a, an anus. And uh, that, what you're seeing over there, is the bowling ball with one hole. Okay, so urethra, vagina, and rectum all opening into a single opening. So what we do for that is we flip them over, like you can see on the left-hand side. We do a midline cleft um, incision and we find where their rectum is, we pull it down to the perineum, and all of a sudden, they've got a rectum, a anus that they can pass stool through. And if any of you are very astute, you will find that, in fact, it was not the picture from the front, because he has got testicles. <laughs> so we do them in quite a few babies. This is an interesting picture of a cloaca, and then a piece of a posterior sagittal anorectoplasty. That does not me excited because of the Botox, although I was, but there was none left over. <laughs> um, one of the things that we also do in the scope of colorectal is for children with Hirschsprung's disease, often come back, even after a very successful operation, struggling to pass stool and with constipation. And that's because their anal sphincters are so tight. And we Botox them, we Botox their bugs. 
and they come back and they can pass stool and it's like you've changed someone's life because you've Botoxed them. And it was just really awesome for us because this was the first time that we managed to get Botox in the state. So it's a happy day. <laughs> Thank you. Fetal surgery. Um, not really something that we have a lot of play with in this country, not yet anyway. Just from a resource point of view, from a number of people on the ground point of view, from the expertise point of view, it doesn't make sense for us at the moment. Um, there are one or two centers that are dabbling with it currently. But this on the edge of fetal surgery um, is something that we did at the state hospitals. And this is called an exit procedure. Exit stands for ex utero intrapartum. So for these babies who are antenatally diagnosed with massive neck tumors, you know that you can't just deliver them because the minute that they pop out, they've got airway compromise. So you need to find a way to make sure that you have stabilized that airway before you cut off their blood supply. So what do we do? We deliver them halfway. We pop out the head and the neck, we leave them attached to the placental circulation with the mom and the anesthetic, and you go and you tube or you trachea or whatever it is that you need to do to stabilize the airway. And only once you've done that, do you disconnect from the maternal circulation. That's awesome. Also, you probably won't see one because in theater there's like three gynees, three anesthetists, three surgeons, three ENTs, three of everybody else who wants to become my posses there, everyone. <laughs> so, I mean, this is it's amazing stuff. Kids are amazing. Getting to work with children is so amazing. And they're amazing because they're honest. Their signs are honest. Their history is not driven by emotion. When kids are sick, they're sick. You will go to work and you'll see a sick kid and the next morning you go back to work and that sick kid jumps off of his bed to give you a hug. Not only has that like made you so happy because this child is better, but it's made your day. Your day is like done. You know, you're happy. But before I like overload you on the warm and fuzzies, um, what do you have to know? So what do you have to like concentrate on to make sure that you have good fundamentals to be a pediatric surgeon? Luckily, it's really simple, and this is a super quick slide, because you need to know everything. Everything. Just imagine everything you get taught, everything. So anatomy, physiology, the baseline stuff. The things that you thought would never be used, right? Second year, micro. Swan bites carry pseudomonas aeruginosa. You think to yourself, oh, who needs to know that? <laughs> who are they training here? I'm not a specialist, I'm an intern. Until you go to bead surgery and you have little people who have fingers that they put in things, plug holes, swan beaks, anything. <laughs> then all of a sudden it's important to know that swan bites carry pseudomonas aeruginosa, believe it or not. So, I mean, that's quick, right? You just need to know everything. And Prof Hadley, who is the professor of pete surgeon KZN, he says, uh, you should never cut through the skin unless you know what's underneath it. I'm going to embellish that slightly and say, you should never cut through the skin unless you know what's underneath it or how it works. Okay, so everything. And I think it was said beautifully by, if you go to the next slide, um, John Kirkland. Now, he was... An incredible man, he died just over 10 years ago. Um, American surgeon who had his heart in surgery but had a, a pension for mechanics and for physiology. And he was one of the guys who actually made cardiac bypass a thing. He made it feasible. He didn't invent it, but he made it feasible. Um, and one of the things that he said, which I think is so true, is that um, at any given instant, everything the surgeon knows suddenly becomes important to the solution of the problem. You can't do it in an hour later, or tomorrow, nor can you go to the library to look it up. It's one of the things that attracts us to surgery, right? It's like on the go, it's immediate. It's the medical equivalent of instant gratification, right? It comes in broken, you fix it, they go home. It's amazing. Okay, continue. So that's good. So you know, right? You need to know everything. Excellent. So that's quick. Let's skip over that. Um, now, I don't think of myself as particularly old. Um, maybe just in my head. But, uh, you know, because old people say things like, um, oh, back in the day, and uh, I remember when the Chelsea band was three rand. You know, that kind of thing. So for this momentous occasion, I'm going to bring that stuff out. I almost saw. I'm such a potty um, I'm going to bring that out and say that um, I remember when I picked up tallies and I looked at this damn textbook and just thought, like, how am I going to get all of this information into my brain. Like, how do I 
how do I, you know, thank you, right? Thank you. I'm not that old. It's like learning a new language and these clinical signs and what's the difference between a sign and a symptom and why do I have to, oh, geez, it's so hard. And eventually, you know, you get into your clinical years and things go a little bit better and you start looking at lots of patients and you start feeling like you're on top of it, right? Like you like, look, feel, awesome, okay, got it. And, and then all of a sudden you get into your peds block. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Now I have to do this on a screaming child. <laughs> you must be mad. It doesn't sit still. It's making a noise. What do I do? <laughs> Listen for brain sounds, do me a favor. Anyway, so these are a few anecdotes um, that I've picked up along the way. I'd like to say that I came up with them. I didn't. I greedily stole them from everybody I saw working in the wards. They're things that a lot of you will already know, um, but some of you won't. And if it's something you didn't know before, at least you know it now. It does make the examination a bit easier. I mean, for me, examination of the neonatal abdomen was like a trip to the dark side of the moon for like the longest time. They were like, can't you feel the liver? No, can you? <laughs> so like I said before, children are honest and their signs don't lie. And I think one of the great parts about pediatric medicine, whether it's medicine or surgery, is that um, it's very akin to veterinary science, don't you think? I mean, they can't really tell you what's wrong. And mom's like, well, it vomited for a bit and then it stopped growing. And like, I don't know, it's scratching itself and then you have to make a diagnosis, right? So it's one of the areas where you have to really trust your, your instinct, you know? Is this abdomen really tender? Like, is it tender, or is this somebody, is this is a kid who's just scared because he's got really bad stomach cramps and he's had gastro for three days and ah. So you have to learn to trust yourself. For neonates, I'm sure you've seen this already. If it's screaming and crying and performing, stick your finger in his mouth. Okay, not his bum, that's the opposite direction. <laughs> but always stick your finger in the bum. Okay, don't put your finger in it, you put your foot in it. So, um, put your finger in the mouth. Let them suck, that sucking reflex calms them down immediately. All of a sudden, you can feel the abdomen. You can feel that liver that was so elusive just a minute ago. Um, more importantly than the finger in the mouth is the dextrose in the mouth. This is something I relearned much later, especially when I started doing painful procedures on neonates. Now, dextrose in neonates is analgesic. Okay, amazing, right? Imagine it was for you too. <laughs> um, and when you give, they think it's got something to do with endogenous and um, opioid release within the body. But it works as an analgesic. So if you have a screaming neonate that you're trying to drip, it does hurt. It does hurt the neonate. Do you know that people did studies on this? Yes, they thought that when neonates cried, that it wasn't actually a pain being perceived. Yeah, so lots of people did studies giving pain to neonates until eventually somebody stood up and went, yes, they do feel pain. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, drips are sore. Central lines are even more sore. So dextrose is something that I use even for examinations if you just want to calm them down. Even a patient who's MPO with an NG tube in, you just a little bit of dextrose to suck on on a swab, Bob's your uncle. That on the left, sorry, right, right hand side of the screen is cello. He was a four-year-old boy, multiple, multiple, multiple admissions for upper uh, lower respiratory tract infections. He had a massive part of his bowel sitting in his chest for all four years with a missed congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Thank you, next slide. Um, yeah, shame she is sweet. That's Panache, the little girl, and the little boy whose name I will never remember because I just always called him Mr. T. Um, <laughs> now, Panache, gets to be on the slide with offer them a sweet. Because Panache ate everything, like I said, everything, right? Um, she also ate oven cleaner, and then she also lost her esophagus. Um, and then we had to give her a new esophagus by uh, pulling her stomach from here and attaching it to her throat. Amazing. But she didn't want to eat. She was a sick child. You gave her something, she was like, mm -mm. But when she was better, you give her a sweet, that thing was gone. Even before she had a stomach, it would come out her neck here from her self <laughs> Well, children will eat, okay? So carry some sweets around with you. Obviously not the ones that are pre-operative, but for everybody else, if the mother is saying, oh, you know, the child's got loss of consciousness and you think, hold on, this chick is malingering, and you give them a sweet, the kid's like, oh. <laughs> 
then that loss of consciousness, that loss of that, sorry. I had loss of consciousness. <laughs> okay, jumping children are not peritonitic. Okay, my favorite thing was, um, you would do this examination on this patient in Barra and you'd be so excited that you found, you know, guarding and puritanism. Yeah, God, both of them, right, Ali and Costa. we so excited and then the reds would come and go, mm -hmm. Seriously? Like, I can try hard. The percussion thing, the rebound thing, the leg thing, everything. <laughs> Kids can be even more difficult. So, if you think that a child is peritonitic, I call it the jump and wiggle. So I get them to jump and wiggle. And if you can jump and wiggle, you ain't peritonic. Okay. Um, and then something that is as per usual, distract all the kids with uh, conversation. Okay. Ask them whatever you want. So the more they keep talk talking, the more they'll realize that in fact what you're doing to their abdomen is not actually as bad as they thought it was. In fact, actually maybe it's fine because maybe that guy at school did like them. <laughs> um, but it's just a way that you can really elicit the signs that you're looking for. Next. <sighs> Never to miss signs. So, Never to miss signs, I mean, it's, guys, it's practice, what can I say? Like, you know, I can tell you whatever I like now, but it's the time that you spend in the wards and it's the time that you are with patients and, oh, it's so crap that you have to be there for so long, but it's the time that you spend. But these three things, if you see them, it's, it's, no, it's no longer your job. Not for now. Not for now. Not, not until you're working here as a pediatric surgeon. This means put a drip and send it away. Okay. I'll take it. So, the first one on the left upper is a um, red current jelly stool. Right? That's the red current jelly stool of interception <coughs> that we all read about in textbooks. Oh, right. Yeah, I was also, the first time I saw it, I'm like, that's not red current jelly. Anyway, that is red current jelly. Um, this means intersusception. And I think the point to come across here is that a lot of our patients come to us with red current jelly stool, but they've been treated for 11 days in a peripheral hospital for dysentery, okay? Because nobody thought to look for intersusception. We've got a medical student with us at the moment from Edinburgh, he's working with us at Barra. He says when they get talked about intersusception, they get told that, oh, red current jelly stool is just something you read about in textbooks. Because it is to them. Their referral times are super quick. Patients come to quaternary institutions. The minute anybody sees a drop of blood from an anal fissure, they get an ultrasound to rule out an intersusception. This doesn't happen there. Their kids present with maybe one episode of vomiting and a few cramps where they have pulled their legs up. So they don't see this. So if you see this, send it to a pediatric surgeon. Okay. Along with that is the picture on the right. Guys, this is not a rectal polyp. It's also not a rectal prolapse. This is an intersusception that got so bad that it intersuscepted out the bum. Okay. In children, they do get rectal prolapse, they do get rectal polyps, that's at the bottom of your differential. If you see something protruding from the bum, please send it on. This is not something that comes to clinic the next day. Um, and then the third negative sign is bilious vomiting. So, um, you know, some of the more like whoop whoop of you um, will know that you go out drinking a lot. Um, maybe that night you start vomiting a lot. Um, and by the time you reach the morning, that vomit is no longer food. It's just yellow, right? It's yellow, it tastes awful, you want to die. And that's bile. That's bile coming out. Okay, maybe a small to the green, but yeah. Now, if you have an intestinal obstruction below the duodenum, and that bile sits in that acidic environment of your stomach and sits there, sits there, sits there. The pigment breaks down further and all of a sudden it goes dark green, like swampy green. Like that top is a beautiful bilious vomit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but like in the best way possible. Like it's like, <laughs> if you see that, send the patient to us, please. Okay. It means that you have to rule out an intestinal obstruction. Okay, it's that until proven otherwise. Green vomiting is bad. Your top is lovely. <laughs> but green vomiting is bad. Okay, so please don't miss these signs. With these signs, now you've diagnosed, 
Okay, I have a very sick child here with intercession. You'll see throughout your training, because you go through blocks where you do pediatrics, you'll be working with people who have a passion for working with children. But you only really realize, like when you're doing general surgery, so you're working in an adult specialty that also sometimes sees children in the periphery, how terrified people are of children. I mean, they are terrified of children. I'm terrified of children. I don't have children. But at work, I'm okay with children. And the reason that they're terrified is because people, like, all of a sudden, when it's a baby, it's like, oh my gosh, like, what, what do I do first? Environment. No, airway, jeepers. So managing emergencies in children is the same as managing emergencies everywhere else. If you stick to your A, B, C, D, E, you'll be fine. Always. Airway, breathing, circulation, you know. Now, normally you say the ABCs. In children, and especially in neonates, it's the A, B, C, D, E's. D is for dextrose. Little children have very labile sugars. So in pediatrics, D is for dextrose. And E is for environment. A neonate will get cold, and when I say cold, I mean hypothermic in 20 minutes. So you do everything you can for your recess, and you CPR, and you put in a line, and you intubate it, and everybody's happy, and the kid still dies, because its temperature is 31. So be cognizant of the other things in pediatrics. But if you stick to your A, B, C, D, E's, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, it's probably correct at this stage to say I don't work for Pedistat. I'm not, I'm not affiliated with Pedistat, but Pedistat is an awesome, awesome, awesome app. I would have liked to have it when I was an internship at Barra because that was amazing. I would have preferred to have it as a comm serve in or wherever. It makes your life so much easier. You can either enter the weight of the child, the age of the child, the length of the child, and it does all the hard stuff for you. So dosages for basic drugs, the size of the ET tube that you need to tube a patient, um, everything done for you. Costs 80 bucks, maybe? 80 bucks? I don't know. I'd already downloaded it. It wouldn't tell me the price. Vicious people. <laughs> anyway, so um, 80 bucks, really good money spent. Um, that's pretty sad. And then, as I was saying earlier, it really, there's no substitute for praxis. It's about the amount of time that you spend in the ward. <laughs> Nothing else. You guys will be fine. If it's, if it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, the path to pediatric surgery. Um, those of you who have done the um, clinical blocks already and have rotated through Barra will know that this is the endless, jaundiced corridor of the surgical area of Barra. <laughs> Um, and sometimes the path can feel like that. It can feel like you are walking down the endless daughter's road. Um, so you will do two years internship, one year concert, depending on what mood the government wakes up in in the morning. <laughs> um, then you become a medical officer, if you want. Um, I personally recommend becoming a medical officer. I think that it broadens your horizons, you get to work in areas that you didn't get to work in, in internship. So, for example, I thought to myself, oh, I really love pediatric surgery, but wouldn't it be glamorous to be a plastic surgeon? Oh, gosh, I just loved So, I did MO time in plastic surgery. And it's an absolutely great profession to those of you who will become plastic surgeons. Wonderful, because I hate it. Hate it, hate it. Those pa you can keep those patients. You can keep them. Hi, it's just that this... Oh, <laughs> anyway, and it gives you a time to go through that. It gives you a time to experience that. It gives you a time to figure out whether you would rather be comfortable or whether you would be passionate and happy with what you're doing. And I think that that's invaluable. So please, medical officer time. It's not a bad thing. Um, that you can do for anywhere up from six months to, well, I mean, 100 years if you wanted to, but who wants to do that? Um, to two years, and the reason that you need that time is so that you can write your intermediates. So, your primary exam is written somewhere in ComServe or your MO time. Then you need two years, minimum, of time outside of your ComServe before you can write surgical intermediates. Intermediates is like more fun stuff. It's like ICU and actual surgery and that kind of thing. If you don't become a medical officer for two years, then you go into another reg program, like a feeder reg program. So for me, I did general surgery for two years. Um, again, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm biased, right, because this is my path, but um, for me, having the opportunity to be a registrar is, again, invaluable. 
you, you can do pediatric surgery without ever being a registrar. You can do it just having gone through medical office time and then getting into your uh, pediatric surgery reg post. Guys, your thinking is so different. It's so different. You know how every year at med school, you're like, no, this is definitely the worst year. <laughs> oh, look at those second years, they know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> then you get into your clinical years and you think, oh my gosh, does anybody know how difficult it is to come to the hospital and then still go home and study? Does anybody know how difficult that is? And then you become an intern and you go, oh, I wish I could go home and study, I wish. Oh, if only I wasn't here all the time. So I'm biased is what I'm getting at. Um, but being a registrar gives you time to think like a registrar. It's different. It's different from any other thinking you've ever done before. It's different from being a medical student and learning how to act. It's different from being an intern and pretending you do know how to act. It's different from being a comm serve where now you're supposed to act, but you're still not entirely sure how. And it's different to being a medical officer, because as a medical officer, you are still always under a registrar. So that forward thinking, that trying to plan for the next step isn't there. I recommend it highly, guys. Be a registrar. I mean, also be 50 when you qualify, but be a registrar. <laughs> After your intermediate, you can then apply for a post in pediatric surgery, which is another four years. Um, and one day, um, I don't know, when unicorns come back and the elephants can fly, you finish. Although, Dr. Singh at the back there, everyone give her a hand, just pass, she's a consultant. So she's the proof that it does actually happen. But at some point you finish, I don't know when, anyway, it happens. Um, but that's the path that you take. It's long, it's arduous, it's horrible. No, you don't know what the outside world looks like. Yes, my feet are killing me because I haven't worn heels in four years. Yes, I had to buy a brand new dress for this occasion because it turns out your scrubs grow with you, but your other clothes don't. <laughs> it's crap. Reg time and anything is crap. I can tell you right now that if you speak to a dermatology registrar, they will tell you that reg time is awful. Awful, awful, awful. Do you know if there is a Stephen Johnson's, they have to go to the hospital. <laughs> the consultant stays at home. It's relative. It's crap for everyone. Where do you want to do it? That's obviously. Um, and this is not just because this is my alma mater and like, I was born in Park Lane and never strayed very far. <laughs> um, this is really, really, really the best place to do pediatric surgery in the country, and I'll tell you why. So the first thing is that you get maximum exposure, and I do mean maximum exposure. So much so that registrars from the other circuits in Madunsa and wherever are now coming through to our department to try and see what is it that we see at Barra because some of them have only seen one gastroschisis before, but I have six ventilated gastroschisis in my night's view. So, you know, maximum, maximum exposure. The other day I admitted a little boy with aphalia. That's when you're born with normal scrotum, normal testicles, and absolutely no penis. It happens one in 30 million children. There's only 80 case reports in the literature ever, but we saw one in Barrow. Actually, it was other gene. Anyway. <laughs> My point is it's the big um, You get closer to the 10,000 hour goal. Um, 10,000 hours is not just a Macklemore song, is it? Um, people have done studies and they have found that if you want to be a master in something, if you really want to crack something, you need to have worked at it for 10,000 hours. Okay? <laughs> Come to this, you'll be very close to 10,000 hours. <laughs> you'll be as far away from two hours of sleep, but you'll be close to 10,000 hours. <laughs> Obviously, we're eagerly awaiting the opening of this new hospital, which will be unbelievable for pediatric surgery and for the specialist surgeries in general. So, I mean, that's going to be unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, Cape Town can rah rah about Red Cross, but we'll have Nelson Mandela and Barra and the Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Teaching. Having said that, I did MO time and I did general surgery rest time. I'm sorry, I'm speaking very fast because I'm not taking forever with this one. I told you, can't get me to stop. <laughs> anyway. Um, I've been through a lot of departments, and I can tell you right now that none of them teach you like you get taught in pediatric surgery. You will be schooled. So on Mondays, we have radiology meetings. That's generally in your hospital with your radiologists. So either at Barrow or at the gym. 
Um, on Wednesdays, we have a grand round. Normally, that is the job of the person who is closest to exams to present a patient and then diarrhea and anal fibrillate for the rest of the hour. Um, and that is then followed by a combined radiology meeting. And that radiology meeting is with everybody. So all of the surgeons, all of the radiologists, you do get a lot from it. Whether it's the surgeons teaching the radiologists radiology or the radiologists teaching the surgeon surgery, you still learn a lot. And then on Fridays, we have a tutorial every day, um, every Friday from 7 to 8, which is a proper teaching tutorial. Um, and that is followed by some sort of other presentation, whether it's a combined meeting with pediatrics, whether it's a journal club, that kind of thing. I can guarantee you, you will not find another unit or department in the entire <coughs> hospital that teaches as much as pediatric surgery. Which means we have no excuse for how dumb we are. So, <laughs> um, Our department is very strict and very eager for research and publications. As you heard, I have the subtitle of two. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but our department publishes more than any other surgical department efforts. And we are driven to research. We have research meetings once a month. Everybody wants to know, nobody cares that you're doing an embed. People are like, please, <laughs> man, that's what I part time. I don't, know, I don't know when else you fit it in, right? Um, but you can do your image in the bath as long as there's other things that you're working on besides that. But our department also gives you massive opportunity. And I'll show you pictures on the next slide. Um, when I get to the next slide. Thanks. Um, oh, my head is huge. <laughs> not make that big. Um, these are pictures from when I went to the States in 2015. I presented a paper at one of the meetings there. Um, this was all paid for via scholarships and the department and funding. And I went to New York for three days and I went to the Halloween parade. And then I went to the most awesome of awesome colorectal conferences. We did a laparoscopic course, as you can see, on teeny tiny neonatal models, which we don't even have here. Um, and it was such an incredible experience just to be there. And I can honestly say that one of the most amazing feelings is working, walking through this hospital, because it's like being back there. I mean, you cannot believe that this hospital is in Johannesburg. It's like mind-blowing. You know, I don't have hot water at work. <laughs> it's a Ronald McDonald hotel upstairs. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so your, your opportunities are vast, and it's what you make of them. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about our department. Hmm. Comparisons. Can't, there's no apples and apples here. It's like apples and oranges. And we don't make sense to the rest of the world. So we like a squarange. I don't know. <laughs> it's an unknown fruit of sorts that you really can't compare to. So like as I said before, um, research and publications, we <clears throat> drive it avidly. We suck compared to the rest of the world. But like suck big time. Like, <laughs> like you wouldn't even go to the party where the other people go to like, publications party. You wouldn't. We recently chatted to one of the guys who works at Seattle Children's Hospital, and he was saying when he has an application for a residency in pediatric surgery, those people come in with 50 to 70 publications behind their name. 50 to 70. Also, their system is a little bit different to ours. So they do multiple fellowships. So you finish medical school, and you get drafted or rounded into surgery or pediatric surgery, and then you just start pumping out fellowships. One of them is a research fellowship. So for a year, you go and you sit in an office. They've got beautiful established databases. Because remember, they also have paperless systems. Like, this is amazing here. They're like 20 years down the line there. And um, basically, all you do is you sit in an office and you turn out like a paper a week. Boom, that's 52 in one year. Thank you. So don't be scared when you see that. It's not working surgeons. It's not surgeons who are in theater every day. It's people who are sitting in an office. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing research, we just have to try a lot harder to be taken seriously, and it's one of the reasons why we aren't yet on the international scene. Uh, from clinical and a surgical perspective, again, there is no comparison. Let me give you an example. We have a girl working with us at the moment. Uh, she's visiting us from Italy. She's finished, so she's a qualified pediatric surgeon. Um, and the other day, I helped her do her first neonatal laparotomy, her first one. She's a qualified consultant. Um, 
My colleagues and I, at about two years into your reach time, you've done around 15 neonatal laparotomies, um, most of them on your own. So you cannot compare that with overseas. You cannot compare assisting in one PSOP ever to actually having the opportunity to do a PSOP. Guys, this is honestly the best place that you can learn <laughs> pediatric surgery. I mean, the actual surgical. If you want to learn publications and research, go elsewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> but what is the infrastructure? So will our country support us in our endeavor to be pediatric surgeons? So, <clears throat> excuse me, the mid-year population estimates from the 2014 census show that there were 16,179,765, woo, Jake Good, <laughs> in South Africa at the age of 14. Now, as of the most recent um, exams, including Dr. Singh at the back, there are currently 49 practicing pediatric surgeons in this country, 49. So when you work that out, it means that every single pediatric surgeon who is currently working covers 330,199 children. Now in the US, they have one generalist pediatric surgeon for every 108,000 or so children. That's under the age of 19, not 14. And you still think, oh, but hold on, that's, like, that's quite a lot, right? So 108,000. But that's because they said general pediatric surgeons. So in America, they've got 761 general pediatric surgeons and 1,716 specialist pediatric surgeons. So actually, when you work it out, they're each treating like, I don't know, 52 children or something. But anyway. <laughs> um, the load is huge in this country. It's massive. It's enormous. And currently at the gen, I'm sure on your tours, they mentioned that there are loads of patients on backlog and on waiting lists. Um, at the gen, we are sitting on 600 patients on the waiting list, and at Barra, 800 patients on the waiting list. Um, it's gotten so bad at the moment that if you have a reducible inguinal hernia, don't even bother coming back to clinic, because the only time you're going to get your operation is once it incarcerates. Then we're like, oh no, <laughs> exit, because <laughs> you've been on the waiting list for three years. The infrastructure is there, guys. It's there because the need is there. So you will never be jobless as a pediatric surgeon in this country. I'm almost done. So what does it actually mean to be a pediatric surgeon in South Africa? It means that sometimes you finish your appendicectomy <coughs> by torchlight because the electricity is gone and also they haven't fixed the generator and also they probably won't and also the roof is falling down. So I mean, really, are you worried about the lights? <laughs> It means that, um, unlike upstairs where everything's gleaming and beautiful, it means that sometimes you have to clean your own theater floors. Although I can't take all the credit for this from a surgical perspective, those are anita just helping out. <laughs> um, but the cleaners were on strike. So the sisters won't put a patient on the table because you did an injection on the last patient, so there's a drop of blood, so now you just clean the floor, but they won't clean the floor, the cleaners are on strike, so you clean the floor. And the patient's not there, so then you go to the ward and you fetch the patient, you report to the patient. So sometimes you do not your job, but you have to do it because otherwise <laughs> it's going to treat the patient. So you clean the floor, you clean your incubators, because heaven knows why you've had an outbreak of CRE again at Barra. It means that after a busy call, um, where you've literally had like a conveyor belt, like child, 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 and you're running across with your kids and you're like, injection, 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 <laughs> 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 And then you go home. You're like, great, it's done. And you wake up the next morning and all of a sudden, like, you know, you've got your Prada Vera Wang and also ketamine. <laughs> and also Chloramax. And you just basically walk home with the hospital in your pockets. That's what it means because you can't get it everywhere, so you keep it with you, so that you're like your own mobile, one-stop surgical, you know? <laughs> Next slide. It means that sometimes you have to comfort your children, because unlike this amazing establishment that we're in tonight, there are no sleepover rooms, there are no sleepover beds, there's nothing. If you have a neonate, tough luck. If you have a breastfeeding neonate, Premature. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, if you have a neonate who's breastfeeding and you've just delivered and your neonate's been sent through on day two of life, 
but you've just delivered, so maybe this is going to hurt you because maybe you'll be bleeding from your vagina that's gross. So you're not allowed to sleep in the hospital. So as a lactating, breastfeeding day two mother, you then have to go home to wherever it is, Muffy King, Clark's or whatever, and leave your child there to have its obligatory formula because where are they going to put you with your bleeding vagina? The comedy of that is that they actually sleep over in the guy wards. Okay, anyway, the mothers are not there. And what it means is that sometimes you need to comfort your children a lot, like when they're a lot exhausted, or a little, when they're just a little bit scared. But it does mean that you get to work with children every day. Thank you, you can do it now. <laughs> it means that you get to make a massive difference in children's lives. It means that Okukhle at the top, who was in hospital for five and a half months, went home. It is the most unbelievable feeling that you could ever imagine working with children and sending them home. And I'll just read one last thing because really I couldn't put this all in my brain, believe it or not. Um, this is a quote that I found from Lord Lister, from Lister Dialect, it's one and the same. And he said in his 18th, 1890-something letter to his father, he wrote to him and he said, if the love of surgery is proof of a person's being adapted for it, then certainly I am fitted to be a surgeon. For thou canst hardly believe what high degree of enjoyment I am from day to day experiencing in this bloody and butchering field of the healing art. I am more and more delighted with my profession. And guys, I cannot tell you how that ring truth, uh, rings true with me. I am more and more delighted every day to work with children. And you can be too. So just learn everything. <laughs> Thank you.